Speaking of old things that don't work, you got a C64 thing to show us? I do. I love my old Commodore 64 and I'm always looking for ways to enhance it. And uh, one of the things I love the most about the C64 is the sound chip that's in it called the SID, Sound Interface Device. It just has this really, you know, because I'm acclimated to it, I grew up with it, I just love the sound of it. So I thought I would uh, do an experiment to see if I could detune a SID alongside of a real SID and make it give me a kind of pseudo stereo harmonizing sound. So here's my setup I want to show. Um, here's an old bread box Commodore 64. I've taken it apart. This is actually one of the Commodore 64's that I destroyed when I did the C64 30 and 1 plug and play. Um, I'll show some bigger pictures of this at some other point, but it's extremely hacked. It's got all kinds of stuff hacked all over it. I have a real C64 SID chip here that I've elevated on a, a chip socket. I've hooked a bunch of wires up to it, and I've run these wires down to an FPGA board, and I've hooked them into an FPGA, and on this FPGA board is a is a another 6502, I mean a, another SID chip. So I'm pretty much in, intercepted all of the signals and I'm bringing them over to the FPGA. So now I want to show you a block diagram of what I'm doing. So here we have the C64. It has a CPU inside of it, the good old 6502, which is feeding uh, signals, uh, commands to the sound chip on a data and address bus. I've intercepted these signals and I brought them across to the FPGA board. I'm feeding them into the FPGA. In here I'm doing detection. I'm figuring out which writes are happening to the, to the SIDs and which ones I want to modify. And then I take, I modify these writes and then I rewrite them out to another SID. This is the secondary onboard SID. And now I've taken the audio signal out of the real Commodore 64 and now the FPGA board, and I fed it into the left and right of the uh, uh, the stereo output. Now I've added a button. So if from a few weeks ago, you'll remember that I explained how you do input on a C64 or on a FPGA. So I have a pull-up resistor to VCC to your positive voltage. I have a switch that goes to ground. So I push this button down. It sends a signal into the FPGA, and inside the FPGA I have a counter. And this counter, every time I push the button, it increments the counter. And what I'm doing with this count is I'm intercepting the writes that are going to the SID, the external SID, and I'm subtracting that from the note that it's going to be playing. So I can reduce the frequency of this SID. Now, um, I'm going to split this into two parts. I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and play the sound that's coming out now, and then I'm going to go through and show the, I'm going to show the steps, what it takes to do a project. It's something I kind of overlooked in the past when I was giving FPGA talks. I want to show the tools um, real quick, and just, just kind of the quick clicks that you do to get a project going. So I'm going to switch over, see if I can get the, uh, the sound out of the SID. So you guys can hear it. Now, for you guys that have headphones, plug them in now because you're going to hear a difference between the left and right channels. And I'm going to hit the button on the FPGA and detune one of the SIDs. That was Whizball, um, one of my favorite tunes on the Commodore 64. Now I want to switch to the, I'm using a, an Altera FPGA in this example. I want to just show you the tool real quick and the, the clicks that I actually use to, to do this um, project. So what I'm doing here is uh, I have uh, the main window here is the Verilog code that I wrote. Um, we've seen that in previous episodes. This one's called Module SID Bend. I have a bunch of signals coming in and out which uh, correspond to the block diagram. The, the data pins are coming in. 
Um, I have a FIFO and some Metaflops in here that um, synchronize all the data to the FPGA. And then I have a piece of logic down here that uh, looks for the addresses that are being written to the SID, and then I'm intercepting those and then rewriting into another FIFO my, my modified writes. And then on the very bottom I have the outputs going to the SID, the assignments to that. So what I would do next after I did the design entry is I would click the button for synthesis, which would bring up a dialog like this, and I'll, I'll just show it, it goes really quick. So when I, when I click start, it's going to go through analysis and synthesis. And what this is doing is checking syntax, and then it's turning this into a gate level netlist. Uh, when I say gate level, it turns it into and, or, xors, um, just raw gates. And then these raw gates will go into the next stage, which is called the fitter. So we're at 9% of synthesis, it's going pretty quick. Um, all right, now we're in the, the fitter stage now. This is where it's trying to fit it within the fabric of the FPGA. So it's taking these raw gates and placing them within the logic cells that are scattered all over the FPGA chip. And it's also fitting the, the I.O. pins. These are the pins that are coming in and out of the chip. Now the next stage that it goes through is the assembler, which is assembling all the files um, that will be used to download to the, to the FPGA. And then it does a timing analysis to give you a report to say whether um, you've uh, achieved the timing. And when I say timing, you have to do a certain amount of work within each clock period that's happening within the chip. If you miss that, then you're not going to get the results that you expect. Um, you'll end up with instability. Once you've compiled the design, then you go to, um, for the first time, then you go and you assign all the pins that you want. You may have a circuit board that's already has all the traces that, that go out to other uh, onto these traces, so you need to tell the tool where you want this to go, and this is the top level view of this particular chip. This one has 208 pins, uh, a lot of them are power and ground. It'll show you um, which ones are power and ground, and then the others will be either um, general purpose I.O. pins, some will be dedicated clock inputs, and you'll click on these and you'll open a, a menu, and then it'll allow you to choose which of these signals go to which pin. After you do that, you recompile again so that the fitter portion of this fits those pins to the correct pin layout of your circuit board. Once you've recompiled, then you go to the download stage. On this particular board, I have, four FP I have two FPGAs and two CPLDs. So I have a download cable. I'll switch and show you what this download cable looks like. So here's a download cable. It hooks up by USB. This is, happens to be the Altera's USB byte blaster. And it has a ribbon cable that hooks to the circuit board that hooks to the JTAG. Um, I don't remember the exact what JTAG stands for. It's joint something, something, something. But anyway, it's a way to, it's a universal way to communicate to chips these days. So there's a JTAG chain where the signals come off of this and they go to each of the chips that are JTAG um, compatible in the chain. And then when you come to, you know, when you scan the JTAG chain, you will see this in the tool. In this particular, you'll see there's four devices. It's identified those. You choose which device you want to configure, which happens to be the EP1K30 in this case. You assign the file that was generated from the tool um, and then you click program and you hit the start button and that quickly it's already configured and you're ready to use your FPGA configuration. Now uh, this is for debugging and when you're ready to make it permanent you can there's several ways that you can configure these. Um, some are programmed one time, some have external memory chips that get programmed and then the FPGA will load the the code in, and then some have to be configured externally by other devices. That's pretty much how you do the flow from start to end on FPGA.